welcome to Maine Public's live coverage of the inauguration of Governor-elect Janet Mills. I'm Jennifer Rooks, along with our political correspondent, Mal Leary, coming to you from the Augusta Civic Center for what we expect will be a two-hour event that will include an address from the first woman ever to be elected governor of Maine. That's right, Jennifer. Janet Mills will become the 75th governor of Maine. But as you say, the first woman to hold the post. So this is a significant historical milestone in Maine politics. For more perspective on this, we're joined by Herb Adams, a former state legislator from Portland, who's also well-versed in the history of the legislature and its traditions. Herb, what do you see as historically important about this event? Well, of course, uh, being the first woman governor of the state of Maine, the date falling when it does for the uh, 200th anniversary of Maine becoming a state next year, and the 100th anniversary of women achieving the vote, 1920, next year. A lot of those things are dates on the calendar, but they also mean something in spirit about the kind of people we are. We're not 100% sure, Herb, that she is indeed the 75th yes. governor of Maine, are we? We are not, actually. In the 19th century, when the job was not at all what it is now, we found uh, a lot of people uh, who were uh, president of the Senate or Speaker of the House served as governor very short periods of time. People resigned to become judges or to go to Congress. And so, at least on paper, there is some very short uh, service that uh, may or may not add up to 74 or 75. But of course, the figure to focus on today is number one, which is what she will be, the All first right. main governor. I want to ask you in just a second, Herb, about um, having this ceremony at this event oh, at the yes. Augusta Civic Center. But now, first of all, tell us why we're hearing applause and then quiet, then applause and <laughs> quiet behind us. What we're really having here, Jen, is a joint convention of the legislature. The House and Senate are meeting jointly to witness this inauguration of Janet Bills. And you have the various groups coming in. Now we're seeing members of the legislature come in to, uh, to their seats. This will go on with various dignitaries, members of the judiciary, uh, members of Janet Bills' family uh, as we go through the evening. All right. Well, Herb, back to you. This is taking place at the Augusta Civic Center, sure. but the Augusta Civic Center has not been around as long as the state of Maine. No. So tell me about <laughs> inaugurations past. Where have they been held? Actually, most of Maine's inaugurations for governor have been held at the Maine State Capitol in the old House of Representatives chamber uh, since, the, uh, since uh, about 1832. In 1975 is the first one held here in the Civic Center. That was Governor James Longley. It was considered, uh, they worried it was going to be sort of a Andrew Jackson uh, crazy uh, stampede, but actually it was very polite and nice. Oh. Okay, we're looking at a photo here. Herb, what is this photo? This is the old, no longer existing house chamber in the uh, state capitol. The same building, but a different floor. Everything inside was uh, destroyed, and this is how it used to look. There were up to 200 main legislators then. There was no limit on the top of it. Uh, now here is the current house chamber. Uh, which everyone would recognize. Women are present only in the forms of their incredible hats way up in the, uh, <laughs> the balcony. In the previous picture, way down in the lower left-hand corner, is uh, the very young Percival Baxter serving his very first term in the legislature in 1909. This is how the chamber would look if you went there today. And I was privileged to uh, participate and watch the last inauguration that was held in the Hall of the House, and that was the second inauguration of Ken Curtis. Wow. Well, Janet Mills is credited with many other firsts in her journey to this stage today. She was Maine's first female criminal prosecutor, the first woman in New England to serve as district attorney, the first female attorney general of Maine, and a post that she now holds as she transitions to governor. And she comes from a well-known family in Maine politics, the Mills clan really begins with Janet's father, S. Peter Bills, who was appointed U.S. Attorney for Maine by President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Interestingly, Janet was not immediately drawn to the law, nor to politics at all. She left Colby College after a year and a half, moved to San Francisco in the summer of love, but in her mid-20s, her father convinced her to move back and attend Maine School of Law, and she there, she would find her calling. 
Well, talking about political legacy, Mal, um, there is a letter that has been circulating on social media today. Perhaps you've seen it. I know that uh, Janet Mills' sister, Dora Mills, put this letter um, on her Facebook page. This is extraordinary, isn't it? Written by Margaret Chase Smith in 1948. Written to a just born Janet Mills. And uh, of course, there was close political connections between the Mills family and Margaret Chase Smith through the years. Uh, many believe that that's one reason why Peter Mills got the position of U.S. Attorney for Maine was through the urging of Margaret Chase Smith. I love the line, remember you have much to live up to because of your two brothers. We'll expect a great deal of you, but I know you can do it. A very prophetic from Margaret Chase Smith so long ago. To a baby girl. A reminder that we are broadcasting on television and radio this evening. We are also streaming our coverage online at mainpublic.org. Mal, as we watch the ceremony unfold here tonight, we should say, as you mentioned, this is actually a joint special session of the legislature, although there will be no floor debates, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> this is a ceremonial session. We're going to see the introduction of the various branches of government. Uh, guests of the of the family, members of her family. Uh, the entire state judiciary has been invited. Most of them are here. Uh, we'll see probably at least one former governor and other dignitaries. Well, and it, usually there would be a congressional delegation here, all of the members, but they are not, and we suspect we know why. And they're in, actually in session. I was watching the Senate in session before I came over to the, to the Civic Center, and they're trying to deal with a manufactured crisis by President Trump, not to, if they the don't fund his wall, there's about seven state agencies that do, are not being funded by the federal government right now. So the congressional delegation is traditionally here, would be here, except they've been called back to Washington because of the federal government shutdown. And in their you know, polite letters of decline to the inaugural committee, they said just that. All right, well, Herb, I understand that um, this day has some historical significance, especially for people who uh, have heard of Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, yeah, so two or three of us, of course, have heard of Joshua Chamberlain. Interestingly enough, this is almost the exact day of uh, his final inaugural. He served four terms as governor of Maine, four one-year terms. And on almost this exact day, tomorrow's the actual day, uh, he was sworn in in 1870 when Maine was 50 years old. And there's there a picture of, and you might be looking at that picture and thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't look like the it's Joshua him, Chamberlain I know, right. but that's what he looked like when he was governor of Maine. Absolutely, a long twizzly mustache and all of that. <laughs> yes, and he served four one-year terms, and this would have been beginning his last term. On the 50th anniversary of Maine statehood, just like uh, Janet Mills will be governor on the 200th uh, anniversary next year. In both cases, it's sort of Joshua Chamberlain was the first Civil War soldier to be served as governor. Janet Mills to be the first woman. In both cases, it's a change of tide, change of time, and the turning of their own eras, mm. our era too. Well, Mal, I understand we're not going to go that far back, but we do have a look <laughs> back at some of the highlights of the inaugurations of the last two decades. Yes, Jen, we we're going to take you back to 1999 the year before the new millennium. Make way, make way, make way for His Excellency, the Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the State of Maine, Angus Stanley King, Jr. 1999 began with the second swearing in of Maine's second independent governor who looked to lead Governor Maine Wright into the next century. Right Angus King had experience in television and decided to begin his inaugural address by narrating a short film. A little less than a year from now, at the end of a cold New England night, the sun's first rays will strike Eastport, Cadillac Mountain, and Mars Hill, and a new millennium will come to Maine and America. To act, to welcome that warming millennium sun to grab that rope around the future and then hold on for all we're worth. Because you know what? It's going to be a great ride. Thank you. 
Four years later, in 2003, Democratic Congressman John Baldacci began the first of two terms with a call for both parties to work together to overcome the many challenges facing the state, including a $1.2 billion deficit. As you can see, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we can only do it if we work together in a true bipartisan spirit. It's been a long time since the state has had a Democratic governor and a Democratic legislature. But that gives me neither the license nor the liberty to move forward on any of my proposal without the involvement of the other party. In 2011, former Waterville Mayor Paul LePage became the first Republican governor since 1995 and promised to be an agent of change. Well, first and foremost, I am a businessman who served his community as a mayor and now as its governor. My pledge to Maine people is very simple. It's going to be people ahead of politics. At his swearing in for a second term in 2015, LePage celebrated his Franco-American heritage and again made clear his feelings for the press. Je dois aussi remercier mon collègue franco-américain pour leur soutien. Je suis un enfant des rues du petit Canada. J'ai jamais imaginé qu'un jour je devrais être votre gouverneur. Mais à vous prendre en charge, nous l'avons fait. J'ai jamais oublié où je où je venais et je n'oublierai jamais votre soutien. Merci beaucoup mes amis. Well folks, we're back. The national experts our local media with due respect said we wouldn't be here today. But they forgot to ask the people who count. Thank you, mean people. Later tonight, Janet Mills takes the stage to become Maine's 75th governor and the first woman to hold the office. Here at the Augusta Civic Center, Superior Court has just come into the room. Um, this whole event at this point, I'm noticing Mal is being presided over by Troy Jackson, Senator Troy Jackson. Why is that? It's a joint convention and historically joint conventions have been presided over by the Senate President. The evening session was gaveled in by House Speaker Sarah Gideon, but when the Senate came in and Troy Jackson arrived, he then became the presiding officer over the Joint Convention. All right, and Herb, you have something interesting to share about uh, Troy Jackson, don't yes, you? Yes, uh, Maine has no lieutenant governor, of course. It's the president of the Senate who stands in as lieutenant governor, should he ever be needed. And in this case, I am absolutely sure that Troy Jackson Here, is the well, only person the from the man. Allagash, and probably will be the only one for a while to serve as uh, president of the Maine State Senate. And Allagash doesn't have a lot of people, but it has a lot of land. It does. Allagash is the largest town in the state of Maine in acreage. Well, Mal, you've been in contact with the Mills inaugural committee. Uh, any sense of what she'll stress in her speech, priorities coming up to this time? I think what you're going to see is that the uh, priorities she laid out in her campaign the health care crisis we're facing, the opioid crisis. Those are the issues she's going to stress, but not really with much detail. She says, these are problems, we've got to solve them. The details I think we're going to be see forthcoming in the weeks ahead. And, and tell me a little bit about what has shaped her um, feelings about health care coverage. Well, she's talked a lot about Medicaid expansion, and that's going to be the first piece of legislation, LD1. And it's very personal for her. Her husband, Stan, uh, died after a very serious complications from stroke. 
Uh, she tried, I remember talking with her then, trying experimental medications, which they couldn't get the insurance company to cover. So a lot of the trials, tribulations, frustrations that Maine people have faced dealing with trying to get health care, she's faced that herself in her own life. And that's with a pretty good insurance plan. The state health insurance plan is attorney general. And here's what she said in a recent interview about that. Well, I got married in my 30s. I was a career woman, a district attorney. It's not easy to date when you're an elected, a woman elected to office, you know, as district attorney. But I met and married my husband. I was taking tennis lessons from him. His wife had died very suddenly of cancer, leaving him with five young daughters. I think they were ages four to 16. So stepping into that situation was probably the least rational thing a person could do. But it was the best thing I ever did. Uh, and we, we have a great relationship, the girls and I. My husband passed away four years ago after effects of a stroke. The last year of his life was a tough one for all of us. He was in and out of care, in and out of hospitals and facilities and uh, juggling that and being attorney general and running for re-election as attorney general was a pretty crazy year. Uh, but uh, keeping the girls, the daughters, all informed and, and part of the treatment program they were very uh, attentive to him, and uh, we probably became closer than ever before. He got great care. I'm not complaining about the care he got, but just, you know, dealing like many other main families, having to deal with, if you are insured, you're dealing with deductions, deductibles, and co-pays, and the cost of prescription drugs, and managing his care, categorizing his care, and fighting the insurance company. You know, I fought, I think, seven denials from the insurance company. I'd be at work, and the, in, the, in the facility would call and say, the rehab facility, the insurance company isn't going to pay anymore. You have to come get him and take him home. Well, he had multiple medical issues. He wasn't someone you could take care of 24 hours 7, and I, don't have the, I didn't have the financial ability to hire somebody 24-7, but those kinds of things, and um, uh, very frustrating. But, you know, in Europe, some countries in Europe, if you present to a medical facility, you have your thumb drive, or maybe they have a thumb drive with all your medical records on it. We don't do that. Maybe some states do. We're not there yet in Maine, but isn't that a simple thing? When you rush your loved one to an emergency room with a debilitating problem, and the doctor or PA on duty says, does he have a medical history? And you go, well, he's been here a lot of times, and he's been there and everywhere for different things, different purposes, and, and you're relying on me for an accurate rendition of his medical care. It, there should be sort of a record there that you could punch in and those kinds of things. So I learned a lot about that. But also, you know, I was lucky. We had insurance coverage. Uh, but there's so many, you know, thousands of Maine families who don't have that. And I want to fight for them as the next governor of Maine. I want to fight for the people who don't have health insurance or those who have only catastrophic care. I want to fight for the small businesses and the self-employed individuals who are struggling with the very high cost of health insurance in Maine. And I think Medicaid expansion is one step in that direction, but it's only one step. There's a lot more we have to do. Stanley Kuklinski passed away in 2015, but he did get to see his wife become the state's first woman attorney general. Emil says she is sad that he is not able to be here tonight, but he would be very proud of what, he's, what she has accomplished so far. Mal, what's going on right now in the Augusta Civic Center? We've just had former governors brought and their wives brought to the stage and introduced. And we're moving down the list of those dignitaries that will be on the stage itself including members of Janet Mills family. Right, and there is one governor who is not here tonight. Most, uh, John Baldacci is here, obviously Angus King is in Washington, but Joe Brennan is here. Uh, why is uh, Governor LePage not here? Uh, governor LePage told me uh, after our main calling program last week that he just did not think it would be appropriate for him to come, in part because of the clashes between he and Janet Mills in her uh, duty as Attorney General. Now we see uh, Janet Mills' baby sister, Dora Mills, coming down the aisle. She's familiar to many people because for many years she was head of Maine CDC. Correct. 
she was. So Mills family members, and again, you all have talked about what a legacy this family is. This is, uh, Janet Mills is not the only Mills to have been made a name for his or herself. Peter Mills served in the legislature for several terms. He's run for governor himself and failed in that, obviously. And now he's running the Turnpike Authority. So he has a long career of public service. Uh, her brother Paul is a great historian that has some wonderful stories to tell, as I'm sure Herb has heard some of them, uh, about how Maine has evolved as a state. Her, my understanding is uh, the family table when all of these children were small, when, when Peter and Paul and Janet and Dora were growing up, was not your typical uh, dinner conversation. From what I understand, Janet and I were seatmates in the house. That is very true. Uh, she was very uh, uh, cordial about it and, let me say, uh, very polite about it. But certainly the, the political discussions were remarkable. Her father uh, was the, uh, uh, the uh, United States Attorney for Maine, for example, who had the obligation that he didn't want of prosecuting Wilhelm Reich, uh, a famous figure in Maine history also. Uh, so certainly the, their meat and potatoes were the politics of the day. We're, we're ah. looking at some photos here, Herb. Tell well, me about these women, because you know many of us have heard about Margaret Chase Smith, and obviously absolutely. it's a historic night tonight with Janet Mills, but these are also women who made history. They are, and it's an appropriate night to talk about them. The woman on the, the right, that is the dark-haired woman looking straight at us, that is Dora Pinkham, who is the very first Maine woman to be elected to the Maine legislature and served uh, in 1923 in the House. As soon as women got the vote, in the United States. She was one of the first uh, to run and was the first to be elected. She came from Presque Isle, a Republican, and the woman on the left that's in profile to us is Maybelle Cheney, who uh, two years later was the first Democratic woman to serve in the House from Lisbon Falls. So they would be pleased, I think, at being here today electronically. Well, for those of you just joining us, I am Jennifer Rooks along with Maine Public's political correspondent, Mal Leary, and former legislator and historian Herb Adams. We are live at the Augusta Civic Center with coverage of the inauguration of Governor Janet Mills. Looking back at the November election, which Mills won under uh, excuse me, uh, with 51% of the vote. She herself has said that she was the right person at the right time in the right place. And she acknowledges that part of that timing had to do with the Me Too movement and the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. I read some national articles about how the Kavanaugh hearings actually brought out more Republican support in many areas. My sense was, and I don't have any scientific backing for this, but my sense was that the Kavanaugh hearings in Maine brought out a lot of women who were angry about that. And uh, though I didn't have any part in the Kavanaugh hearings, obviously, I think that um, it, it didn't hurt my, my chances. I think women were, women were energized. But us standing at the polls on election day, standing in Bangor for a while, and um, uh, a lot of women came through to vote and I would get really warm hugs and good feelings from them. I thought, this is good, this is good. But when a couple of burly men came through and I thought, they're not gonna hug me. And they came up and hugged me, I said, I got this one. <laughs> you know, it felt really good. In my book, I ran because I felt I was the most qualified person for the job. And I hope the people, and I hope that history supports me in that. I hope I do a good job. I feel like I have a good relationship with people in the departments of state government now, good relationship with legislators on both sides of the aisle and in both houses uh, of the legislature. I hope to keep it that way. Hope we'll, I always say, I hope they understand that when I take the oath of office and when I step into that governor's office, the door will be open. There'll be an open door, an open mind, and an open heart. That's the way I feel about it. That's the way it should be. Mills has said that she wants to set a different tone from recent years and work collaboratively and transparently with both parties. The new Senate Republican leader, Dana Dow, told the Boston Globe that he thinks Mills will be a kinder, gentler governor, somebody who shows more respect to individuals, and somebody he says his colleagues will be happy to work with. It's very quiet here in the room, Mal. Why is that? 
That's because they have just sent the committee out to invite uh, Janet Mills to come in and take the oath of office as the 75th governor of Maine. And that's why everything is really quiet and it's going to get rather thunderous when they come back. Okay, so this is kind of part of the formalities, isn't it? This a committee going out to receive Janet Mills. She's actually just out there waiting somewhere, right? Exactly, and this is the pomp and circumstance that Herb was talking about that's been going on since we became a state. And a lot of these traditions have developed over the years. Uh, if you go back and read the real history early on, some of these things weren't done. They were much short-circuited and they weren't quite so fancy. But as the state grew older, it, it uh, developed these traditions, including the joint convention inviting the governor uh, to be sworn in. Well, Herb, I want to ask you, you were, you were here joining us because of your historical knowledge, but I didn't know you were a seatmate with Janet Mills in the legislature. Yes, yes. Uh, I hear that she has quite a sense of humor. Oh, that she did. We were fortunate <laughs> that we were up in the back two rows. So uh, much like children in school, we could get away with a little bit as long as you were fairly quiet. The back two rows uh, seem to have been uh, heavily loaded with a certain sort of person and she fit in very well. And, and would you describe her um, style as collaborative? Oh, very much so. You know, we, we all come from every kind of a background in the legislature. And we all serve on different committees and you see each other at certain stressful times uh, when you're debating bills on the floor and the like of that. Um, so your picture of how people act and the way that they uh, deal with an issue or with other people becomes pretty apparent pretty quickly. And she was always uh, very pleasant to work with, good sense of humor, was able to put things back in proportion and they seemed just about ready to slide off the table. Everything was uh, a lot of fun to have her near us. Okay, what's going on? What are we missing now? We saw a uh, cutaway to a small child rubbing his eyes. Uh, a little impatient with the whole I, thing? I would think so. Kind of young to be at a formal ceremony like this, where he's going, you know, why am I here? Oh, my goodness. Well, Mal, do you have any um, stories to share in your years of covering Janet Mills as Attorney General or in the legislature that would shed some light on what kind of leader we can expect? Uh, as, as the Attorney General, she has been very careful in terms of how she looks at each particular issue and how it will affect the people of Maine and develops, you know, the, the legal background before she decides she wants to do something. In other words, she lets the law drive her policy. She doesn't turn around and let the policy uh, drive things by itself. And that means that sometimes we as reporters get frustrated because something a big issue will be happening and we'll be pushing her well what are you going to introduce for legislation are you going to sue on this matter and she'll go well i'm not sure yet i'm still looking at it so i think you're going to see that same sort of action as governor where she's going to deliberate on issues before she decides you know what kind of action she's going to propose and it's going to be within the context of all the other actions she has to take as governor all right. Herb, tell us a story of, um, that, that you feel like illustrates who Janet Mills is as a, as a politician. Is there a particular bill or a particular discussion that you remember when you think about the time you shared with her in the legislature? Well, I can remember one particular story. Sometimes uh, the legislature would sit as a group in the House of uh, Representative Chamber, and sometimes people that you might not have expected would come to address you. And we would have uh, sometimes great authorities on, on different subjects. And I, I couldn't begin to tell you what this particular guy was, but he had a string of credentials, as long as the main turnpike, you know, Secretary of Agriculture in the Eisenhower administration, you know, Director of Quaternary Studies at the University of Alaska, and I want about 25 of those things. And this little voice behind him, I mean, it's Janet Mills going, enough, my mind is full, my brain is full, enough, enough, enough. So all of us up in our corner ended up laughing, inappropriately for the poor fellow who was about to speak. But she, she had that good sense of levity and also a sense of gravity, though. She knew what was very important, was able to hop up on her feet in, in, uh, in debate that uh, maybe had taken a turn hadn't been uh, anticipated, and speak awfully well, right without notes, right from the heart, right off the top of her head, which is a real talent if you're attempting to sway people's votes and their opinion. You have to do it right 
and you get, have to do it well because you can only do it once. She was very good that way. And Mel, uh, Governor-elect Janet Mills has acted very swiftly in appointing people to very important posts. Some of these posts were not, are not always in place when the governor takes office. Tell me about some of the appointments so far. Well, none of them are actually in place when she becomes Or, or named, I should say, yes. She, is, she says she's going to nominate them. There's a whole process they have to go through with a hearing before a legislative committee. Uh, the committee votes and the state senate votes. So it's going to be well into January before we start seeing these commissioners uh, take office. But even the announcements are pretty swift, haven't they been? Much more swift than with other, for example, under Governor LePage. Uh, just, she didn't take any break from New Year's Day. On New Year's Day, she said she's nominating Jerry Reed, who's the longtime director of the Natural Resources Division, I think I got that right, in the Attorney General's office to be the new commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. That's a major post, a very important post. Uh, she's, she uh, also took from her office, uh, Christian Figueroa, who is basically the financial person in the AG's office, and she's gonna be the new finance person. We hear some tentative applause. A procession is coming in. I, I, my eyesight isn't what it used to be, uh, Mal. Is that John Martin in the front? I believe that's the committee that has notified. Uh, yep. Yep. As a senior member Dana of the legislature. Down. Yeah, yeah. Saw and Millet. Yeah, Saw and Millet. So, uh, so again, what's going on? Why are why are these legislators coming into the room? These are the legislators that earlier, uh, Senate President uh, Tory Jackson. A name to go and inform the uh, governor-elect that the legislature Mr. is Chairman. in joint convention. And the chair recognizes the senator from Cumberland, Senator Breen. Mr. Chairman, we have delivered the message with which we were charged and are pleased to report that the governor-elect will attend forthwith. <laughs> the chair hears the message and thanks the messenger. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the pomp and circumstance that we were talking about earlier. Even the phrasing is historic. Do we have any sense of how long forthwith is? It should be relatively quick and really forthwith. We should have the Herald um, announcing the governor-elect shortly. Um, uh, Mal, we were talking about some of the people that she's already chosen to appoint as commissioners. Uh, the warden of the Maine State Prison uh, uh, and former Willoughby. sheriff Randy Liberty will be head of the Maine Department of Corrections. Portland, former Portland Police Chief Mike Soschuk uh, will head up. Department of Public Safety. Yeah. Wh who else do we know? Uh, I'm trying to remember the whole list. I know, off the top of your head. So many of them. I think, I um, can't remember her first name, Judy Camus, I believe. Uh, being named right, right. Camuso, that's right. Yep. to Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, all those nominations are going to, as I said, go through a process. So she's going to have this kind of limbo land in January when she will have people that she wants to take over as commissioner who are still going through the process. And by the first week in February, she has to propose her two-year budget. Oh, boy. And Herb, one thing I think is interesting, in Maine, unlike some other states, the legislature is seated before the governor that is, is uh, sworn in. Um, what kind, how does that affect the work of the legislature up until the point when the governor is in office? Uh, the best read on that would be because back in 1819, when we wrote the Constitution and separated from Massachusetts in 1820, we were quite fed up with it coming from the top all the way down, from Boston all the way to us. So when we wrote our Constitution, the legislature is actually, uh, the people's chambers are in the beginning of the Constitution. Uh, they are created in that sense before the governorship. Uh, the governor in those days was seen more as a, uh, well, yes, not a figurehead necessarily, but you know, head of state, uh, but not necessarily head of process in the days when the issues were not so complex and uh, not so great. Today it would mean that there is a lot to be done in the legislature. You're creating committees, you are securing your officers, you're setting your schedules. There are about 17 different subcommittees of the legislature. Every legislator serves on one, sometimes several. It takes a lot to get that all done and all put in place. So you do meet. It's, uh, you meet in the morning, you're uh, in the general chamber, 
you get the agenda for the day, you participate, and then you break up and go to your committees to do the work. What are we looking at here, Mel? We're looking at the official procession starting with the uh, members of the state's military guard units. And we should have the Herald, who is uh, Colonel Brenda Jordan, uh, the first woman, you know, a woman. Uh, first uh, woman Herald. Woman oh, Herald. Oh, wonderful. Make the formal announcement. Hear ye, hear ye, make way, make way, make way. Her Excellency, the Honorable Janet Trafton Mills. <laughs> Mel, are we about to hear some music? We are from the uh, state police. All right. Pipe and drum. And I'm not sure if what I just said was uh, broadcast, so I will repeat it. This is the live coverage of the inauguration of Governor Janet Mills. I'm Jennifer Rooks here with Mal Leary and former legislator and historian Herb Adams. And we are about to see, I believe, Governor-elect Janet Mills enter the Civic Center. Come in with uh, Chief Justice uh, Lee Offley and General Florida, the Adjutant General of the State of Maine. Uh, this is traditional. They, they will accompany her up to the stage, and of course, try to be 
in the back lot and not noticed her two state police detectives who are part of her security detail. So again, uh, Governor elect Janet Mills, it looks like here, uh, giving a big hug to her sister, Dory Ann Mills, and it looks like she's pinning something to her chest. We'll find out what that is. Uh, hugs from uh, folks who position themselves on the end of the aisle, longtime friends and family members, legislators, supporters. As Governor-elect Janet Mills comes into the Augusta Civic Center and gets ready to give her first address to, as Governor of Maine. Absolutely. And again, this is loaded with the pomp and circumstance that goes back decades, if not centuries, uh, of how we see the change of power from one governor to another. That was Secretary of State Matt Dunlap, Speaker of the House Sarah Gideon. Members of our family. Members of our family. Maine has a female Speaker of the House, woman Speaker of the House, a woman Governor. Not the first woman Speaker of the House, but right. the second, right? Libby Mitchell? Libby Mitchell was first. And and Libby the, Mitchell had the first as the first Senate president as well. Who we, we knows Senate president? She would be the third woman Speaker of the House, Hannah Pingree. That's right, Hannah Pingree as well. Okay. Served in between. Again, Senate President Troy Jackson of Allagash at the rostrum. At this point, he's trying to bring the convention to order so they can have the uh, color guard brought in. Please remain standing for the presentation and posting of colors by the Maine National Guard, followed by Alan Igarineza of Portland, who will sing the national anthem. All right, Mal, we're seeing the National Guard Color Guard present, uh, uh, of course, the American flag, the flags of the military services, and the flag of the state of Maine. What do we expect next? Uh, after this, we're going to move to uh, the invocation, uh, which is going to be by the Reverend Kenneth Lewis of Green Memorial Zion Church and Rabbi Erica Arch, I've got that wrong, of Temple Bethel. All righty. And then we're going to have some entertainment. <laughs> and possibly uh, a national anthem here as well. Um, presenting of the colors at the Augusta Civic Center for the inauguration of Governor-elect Janet Mills, soon to be Governor Janet Mills.
last gleaming whose brush stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rim pots we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs burst singing air gave proof through the night that a flag was seething Oh, say, does the star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land and of the free Governor-elect still, uh, grandchildren is going to be doing the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm not sure which one. Maybe more than one. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nice touch there. It was, and uh, now we're going to move to the color guard, leaving the stage, moving on to the invocation. This is Maine Public's coverage, Maine Public Radio, Maine Public Television, and online coverage of the live inauguration of Governor Janet Mills. We are at the Augusta Civic Center uh, in Augusta. Janet Mills will take the oath of office very shortly after a little bit of entertainment, after the retiring of the colors, an invocation, some entertainment, and a poem this year, something that uh, was done in the past, but not in the recent past. That's right, the former state uh poet Wesley McDare wrote a poem particularly for this inauguration. He'll be reciting that after we have a little entertainment from the Portland String Quartet. So a few things to go. Uh, um, the inaugural ceremonies seem to be a little ahead of schedule. We are expecting to have an inaugural address around 7.30, but I think we're going to have it a little earlier than that, Mal. As the color guard leaves the house, the house being the Augusta Civic Center here in Augusta, Maine. And uh, this is where civic uh, inaugural ceremonies have been taking place for about 40 years now? That's correct. Since 1975, Governor Longley was the, the very first to uh, move it here. For many years, the House of Representatives chamber in uh, the Capitol is the largest civic uh, gathering place, not a church, in Augusta. And it was exceeded, of course, by the building of this uh, civic center now. And the better that we have it here. You know, Maine has very few civil ceremonies that are for all of us. We all enjoy uh, Memorial Day or Veterans Day and the joy of the 4th of July. But this is a ceremony that belongs to all of us and it's one of Maine's very few civil ceremonies. Every four years we gather and start afresh and with plenty of hope.
will now have the invocation by the Reverend Kevin, Kenneth Lewis, Ambassador Molly and Dana, and Rabbi Eric Ash. Kenneth Lewis from Green Memorial AME Zion Church in Portland. I rise and stand before this august body to offer prayer on the cusp of the bicentennial of Maine statehood, the dawning of this historic inauguration of Janet T. Mills, the first woman elected governor in Maine's 199 year history of statehood. I pray at this historic moment as an African-American man, Chappaquiddick Wampanoag Native American citizen. I pray as an ordained elder of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in America founded in 1792, the church home of James Varick and Alexander Walters, of Stephen Gill Spotswood, the church of Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. I pray with earnest hope and expectancy that the promises of Maine's constitutional preamble be fulfilled, that we, the people of Maine, in order to establish justice, ensure tranquility, and provide for our mutual defense, promote our common welfare, and secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty, acknowledging with grateful hearts the goodness of the sovereign ruler of the universe in affording us an opportunity. Heavenly Father, source of all life, freedom, and authority, we come before you in solemn prayer on this inauguration day of Janet T. Mills, the 75th governor of the state of Maine. We thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon our state, from its shores to its mountains, to its farms, towns, and cities. We ask that you continue to watch over this free state, its citizens, and its leaders, now and for many years to come. You are with us in every transition and in every change. And as we enter into this new era with excitement and even some anxiety, we recall your deep compassion, your presence, and your abounding love. We thank you for the gifts, talents, and skills which you have blessed us with. We thank you for the experiences that we have brought, that has brought us to this moment. We thank you for the work of others that gives breath and depth to our own work. Almighty God, bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from discord, from violence and confusion, in the frailty of our own hearts. May wisdom and compassion be the stability of our times and our deepest trust in thee, in whom we live and move and have our being. Come fill us with generosity as we are challenged to let go and others allow to share with us the goods and beauty of the earth. The Old Testament prophet Micah reminds our elected leaders and reminds us all of the requirements associated with leadership he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, Lord, open unto us light for our darkness. Open unto us courage for our fear, hope for our despair, peace for our turmoil, joy for our sorrow, strength for our weakness, wisdom for our confusion, forgiveness for our sins, love for our hates, thyself for ourself. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, Keep us forever in the path we pray. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is our Christ. Amen.
Again, Reverend Kenneth Lewis from Green Memorial AME Zion Church in Portland giving one of the invocations this evening, I believe approaching the rostrum now, Ambassador Molly Dana from the past. I'm not a religious Nation. leader per se, uh, but I thought it made a lot of sense to have the voice of an indigenous woman in the room tonight, and I am happy uh, to be here and share in hopes of a new era, maybe, and not because I've forgotten what's in the past, but because I'm very hopeful for the future. Thank you. Thank you. To Governor Mills, to the state of Maine, and to honored guests, Indaliwizi, Molly and Dana, Nujaya Obanawapskewi, Gamach Nolas Weltamultibin. My name is Molly and Dana. I am from the Penobscot Nation, and I am so thankful to be here. Thanks. <laughs> I find it humbling and a true honor to be here at this event tonight. As a woman of Maine, and as a mother of two daughters, hi Carmela, hi Layla, I love you. <laughs> the excitement I feel uh, of a woman holding this sacred office is both inspiring and well overdue. Maine means a lot to me. I grew up on Indian Island, the Penobscot Nation, nestled in the center of our beautiful state. The Penobscot River not only surrounds our island, but gives us life with both the way it holds our history and protects our future. We hold ceremony at Katahdin, our sacred mountain, which watches over us and reminds us that the ancestors are always with us and ready to give us advice when we need it. Nobody can own these elements. We believe that we are from them and to them we shall return. Taking care of Mother Earth means taking care of one another. The Wabanaki nations of Maine, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy, and my home, the Penobscot, are not just the indigenous people of Maine, but also the carriers of truth of these lands and waters. This place is not just our homeland, it is our whole existence. When we see the terrors of environmental distress, disease, poverty, addiction, suicide, and illnesses in our communities, it spurs us to action to protect the sacred and connect with those around us to find solutions to these things that truly plague us all. There is power in unity. When tribal nations are seen as sovereign bodies, we can work better with our relationship with other governments. When indigenous people are seen as people and not stereotypes or mascots, we can build on shared humanity. You're really gonna like this next one then. <laughs> when cities and towns take the true an honorable step of celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday in October. We find truth and love in our neighbors and a foundation of trust and understanding. It is all about respect, all of it. I want to thank Governor Mills for a genuine desire to listen to me during her campaign for insight and conversation, for laughter, and for some advice. And I want to thank her for taking a stand on behalf of our people when it comes to Indian mascots in Maine before she even took office. I have hope, yeah. <laughs> I do have great hope for continued efforts to reach common ground and attempt to mend the bonds between the indigenous nations of Maine and the governing entities. This will take time, not an easy fix. It takes motivation to listen to one another. It takes a meaningful seat at the table, and it takes open hearts and minds. I come here tonight with a genuine desire for all these things, and I believe in the potential for reciprocity. In her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer, a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, says transformation is not accomplished by waiting at the edge. I see a lot of people in here ready to take a big plunge. I wish you all blessings on this very significant new year, and may all your transformations be the light of tomorrow. Thank you so much and all my relations. Thank you.
Representing the Wabanaki tribes of Maine, that was Ambassador Molly and Dana representing Penobscot Nation. Tonight, in this room and across the state, the citizens of Maine gather to witness a change of leadership. From the new immigrant trying to learn English, to the small business owner who worked through the holidays, from the parent who hopes that education is a way for their child to get ahead, to the child wondering how to afford care for aging parents from the lobsterman hoping for a good day, to the small town mayor and school superintendent trying to balance the budget. Mainers are looking forward with hope and optimism and some trepidation to this new year. We have work to do. In the text by Yikra Rabbah, a collection of rabbinic stories, we read of a parable told by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yoshi. A group of men were on a ship far from land. One of them took a drill and started drilling underneath him. The others were shocked. They said, what are you doing? He replied, what do you care? It is not, it is, not is it not only underneath the my area that I am drilling? They replied, but the water will rise and flood all of us on the ship. I pray in the Jewish tradition, Eloheinu velohe avotenu v'imotenu, our God and God of our ancestors. May we, the citizens of the state of Maine, remember we are all on the same ship. We are a diverse... <laughs> we are a diverse community with many stories and passions, but we rise or fall together. We ask your blessing upon our governor-elect. May the one who blessed the daughters of Zelophehad with the vision of a just society and the tenacity to fight for that vision, bless her with the patience and will to stick to her principles. May the one who blessed Batya with compassion for a supposed opponent, bless her with a spirit of curiosity and caring for all people, no matter what their background. May the one who blessed Esther with the courage of her convictions and the ability to stand up for her people, Bless her with the power to speak her mind and stand up for the people of Maine. May the one who blessed Miriam with a dancing spirit bless her with moments of joy and love. And may the one who blessed Bruria with the wisdom to be the only female scholar in a study hall run by men bless her with insight, toughness, and humor as she becomes our first female governor. I close with a beautiful prayer that we in the Jewish tradition recite on special occasions or for new experiences. We recite this prayer tonight for the first day of a new administration, a new day for the state of Maine, and a historic first for women. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, praised are you God, ruler of the universe, Shehechianu, who has given us life, the most precious of all gifts, Vikiyamanu, who has sustained us, who has kept us whole on our journey, Vihigianu Lazman Haza, and who has brought us to this time of joy and of hope. Amen. Rebecca Erica Ash from Temple Bethel in Augusta, leading the third invocation in tonight's ceremony. Next up, we understand Maine's former poet laureate, Wesley McNair. My pleasure McNair. to introduce Wesley McNair former Poet Laureate, to read an original work created for the inauguration to the Joint Convention. On behalf, of, <clears throat> on behalf of all Maine's poets, I want to begin by thanking Janet Mills for bringing poetry to this inauguration. <clears throat> the
the song for the unsung. Let us sing a song for the unsung, for the Maine muskrat, whose name misunderstands the beauty of its sleek tail and its small, delicate ears. And for the ground moss that brings forth tiny red blossoms each summer that we do not see, though they are right there at our feet. Let us sing for what we have overlooked the simple faith of the gardener in an overcoat, opening the barren ground of October for tulip bulbs, and of the teacher who finds in the student's failure the opportunity to start again. And let us sing for the hopeful starting again of the doctor who sits with the repeat patient in recovery and for the single mother who begins each day by leaving her children behind for the job that will support them, and for the immigrant father with two jobs and a dream of bringing his family to a new life in Maine, already a Mainer himself in his perseverance. For the song we will sing is not only about faith and hope but persistence in spite of the odds. Like the tenacity of the main town moderator who read the warrant article so forcefully that he spit out his upper plate, <laughs> then caught it in midair, popped it back into his mouth and carried on. <laughs> that unsung moderator deserves a song as does this gathering of public servants tonight, including a legislature with 72 women who have themselves persisted against the odds. And a female governor, also a poet, whose most, whose most sustained an inspiring song in the service of teachers and students, doctors and patients, parents and kids, new citizens and Mainers everywhere is about to be sung. Former poet laureate Wesley McNair, he mentioned in his poem now that Governor-elect Janet Mills writes poetry herself. About 30 years ago, she premiered her poetry in a book published in Portland and just gathered with some of the poets who were in that book, uh, I think a weekend ago. It's called Balancing Act. Boy, does she have to remember that one. My pleasure to welcome Shai Paka, Natalia Badu, the Franklin County Fiddlers, and the Portland String Quartet to offer three musical selections for this joint convention. What do we see? Are the ah? Uh, they're in the corner of the room there. Aha! Uh -huh.
and that was the Franklin County Fiddlers. Clearly a hit here at the inauguration ceremony for Governor-elect Janet Mills. People uh, tapping their feet and clapping their hands. Not the only entertainment this evening though. I think Senator Jackson is going to tell us what's next. Maybe? Aha! We have Shai Paka and Natalia Mbadu. She's just a girl and she's on fire I don't like a fantasy Longer than a highway She's living in a world and it's on fire Feel the catastrophe But you know she could fly away What a moment. There we have 11-year-old Shai Paka and 10-year-old Natalia Mbadu. And uh, boy, um, that shot said it all. Those two beautiful girls singing with Governor like Janet Mills, Supreme Court Chief Justice Lee Softly, and Sarah Gideon, Speaker of the House, all in the same frame together. A lot of moist eyes in the house. Very moving moment. Poor Portland String Quartet has to follow that up.
Wow, we didn't know what the Portland String Quartet was going to play. Turns out to be Simple Gifts, Shaker Melody, written in New Gloucester, Maine. Another beautiful moment in this inauguration ceremony of Governor Janet Mills here at the Augusta Civic Center. Herb, the oath is coming next. That it is. What do we know about the Bible? Do we know anything? Well, the Bible is not actually part of the Constitution, federally or statewide, but it became a tradition because George Washington did it. The <laughs> <laughs> Bible is being held by Governor-elect's grandchildren. The Governor-elect, please step forward, raise your right hand, and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Janet Trafton Mills. Do swear. Do swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and of this state. That I will support the Constitution of this state and the United States. So long as I shall continue a citizen thereof. So long as I shall continue a citizen thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I, state your name. I, Janet Trafton Mills. Do swear. Do swear. That I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully discharge. To the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. The duties incumbent on me as governor of the state of Maine. The duties incumbent on me as governor of the state of Maine. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> According to the Constitution and the laws of the state. According to the Constitution and the laws of the state. So help me God. So help me God. <laughs> Hugs for the grandkids. Pretty soon we're going to hear from Secretary of State Matt Dunlap, Matthew Dunlap. <laughs> Troy. <laughs> Troy, Senator Troy Jackson urging on the crowd here. Pretty soon we'll hear from Secretary of State Matt Dunlap, who is going to uh, give a proclamation. And, and if somebody's good at a proclamation, it's Matt Dunlap. <laughs> the Secretary of State, Matthew Dunlap, will come forward and read the proclamation. It is my solemn duty, distinct privilege, and one of the great honors of my life to present this proclamation given under my hand the second day of January in the year 2019 to the Joint Convention. The votes given on the sixth day of November last in the cities, towns, and plantations of the state of Maine for governor the returns of which have been made to the office of the Secretary of State, having been examined and counted by the legislature, which has declared that a plurality thereof was given to Janet Trafton Mills, that she is duly elected, and that she, having in the presence of the two branches of the legislature in convention assembled, taken and subscribed the oaths required by the Constitution to qualify her to discharge the duties of that office I therefore declare and make known to all persons who are in the exercise of any public trust in this state, as well as all good citizens thereof, that Janet Trafton Mills is Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the State of Maine, and that due obedience should be rendered to all her acts and commands as such. God save the great State of Maine! Do you think he was having any fun? He was having a lot of fun. <laughs> He's not the, the shy. <laughs> so, and I don't know if you noticed, but there was, Janet was signing some documents on the roster. That's the actual paperwork making her cover.
It's hard for me to top the Secretary of State, but <laughs> it is my true honor and privilege to present the Honorable Governor of the great state of Maine, Janet Trafton Mills. Television, but people are stomping their feet as though this were a basketball game or something <laughs> like you. that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Madam Chief Justice, Madam Speaker, and Mr. President, members of the 129th Legislature and members of the state and federal judiciary and former governors honored tribal members and chiefs and members of the military friends and family, honored guests, and those 4,346 friends of mine on Facebook. <laughs> I also draw your attention in more serious vein to the empty chair, empty seat in the military section, which recognizes and honors all main service members who are currently deployed. It is with humility and gratitude that I stand before you this evening. I welcome you to a ceremony that represents both a change in the individual who occupies the office of the Chief Executive and, and the peaceful passing of the torch of progress. There are many in this state who are the unsung, as poet Wes McNair has called them. They are the firefighters and teachers, the techies and hotel workers, the farmers and fishermen, the waiters and loggers and the barbers and mill workers of our towns. They are our friends, our neighbors, they are immigrants and laborers, veterans, people with disabilities, people from away, people we rely on every day, and many who rely on us. This governorship is about them, the men and women of the state of Maine. This year, you know, for the first time in our state's 198-year-long history, after 74 men from York, Cumberland, Penobscot, Androscoggin counties finally you have elected a governor from Franklin County. <laughs> I am from the foothills of Maine, western Maine, which bred Margaret Chase Smith and Carrie Stevens and Cornelia Crosby, known as Flyrod Crosby, who was the first Maine's first registered guide in 1897, first registered guide, male or female, and who famously said, I would rather fish any day than go to heaven. Sorry. <laughs> in recent weeks, I've received many letters. Eight-year-old Lucy wrote, quote, now I feel like I could become governor someday. And the morning after the election, one mother left a note in her daughter's lunchbox. It said, Janet Mills won last night, it said. She's the first woman to be the governor in Maine ever. Think about all the things you can do. Love, Mom. I do think about all the things they can do, along with their brilliant brothers, uncles, and fathers. But truly, this milestone this year, this milestone, this one day will be all commonplace, like drinking milk or eating toast. When future generations read of this day, they'll wonder what all the fuss was about. Sometimes our culture moves slowly in the stream of change. Streams, like the people of Maine, change direction 
on occasion to find the best way forward. Many days I awake to see the mist rising from the sandy river as it steers its course across, down, the, down to the Kennebec, the winter's breath unveiling a new day in my hometown, a new day in this state. Then I hear the familiar sounds of chickadees, church chimes, and jake breaks. <laughs> this is home in Maine. The Sandy River pours out of Rangeley Lake and meanders through my town and gains momentum on its way to the Kennebec. And there it joins other tributaries, tributaries to become a powerful waterway, a loud home to eagles and salmon, stripers and sturgeon on its course to Merry Meeting Bay. The Sandy River connects my town to those upstream and downstream and we become one with the rest of Maine linked by water, woods, and land. Former Governor Joshua Chamberlain described this link back in 1876. He said, this great and wide sea, these beaches and bays and harbors, these things invite the brave, the noble. Thought comes here and dwells. They will love the land, he said, and the land will give back strength. The Wabanaki people know this bond. Their wisdom was passed along by people like Joseph Addian, legendary governor of the Penobscot Nation, a brave, open-hearted, and forbearing individual who guided Henry David Thoreau in his first moose hunt through the vast and primitive wilderness to Chisuncook Lake. The plaque that overlooks Addian Lake, named for him, reads, Rise free from care before the dawn and seek adventure. Today we rise a new day before us and seek adventure. <laughs> yeah. But today our connection to the land is endangered. After 80 years of studies, warning that carbon emissions are destroying our environment, the danger is now at our doorstep. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than almost any other saltwater body in the world, driving our lobsters up the coast. Our coastal waters are growing acidic, temperatures fluctuating, the sea levels rising, endangering our shellfish industry, while our forests are less suitable for spruce and fir and more suitable for ticks. Climate change is threatening our jobs, damaging our health and attacking our historic relationship to the land and the sea we love. Tonight I say enough. Enough with studies, talk and debate. It is time to act. Our administration will embrace clean energy, change our modes of transportation, weatherize homes and businesses, and reach a goal of 50% of our electricity coming from Maine renewable resources. And these actions will create good paying jobs, preserve our environment, and welcome young people to build a green future here in Maine. And by the way, when you drive by the Blaine House in the coming weeks, look for some new solar panels that we're going to install. Why not? <laughs> we need a healthy environment, and we need healthy people. Maine voters agreed, which is why they voted to expand Medicaid. <laughs> Hospitals, nurses, doctors, and business all, businesses all agree as well. Health care is for everyone, not just the well-to-do. It is for the small business, 
the small businesses struggling to pay high health insurance bills. It is for the family on the brink of bankruptcy because of one illness, accident, or medical mishap. It is for the community that takes up collections in a jar at the corner store to pay for a neighbor's medical costs. It is for people like my friend Patty. My friend Patty was a vibrant, intelligent, and charitable woman, an athlete, and mother of three wise children, loved by all and uninsured. She died needlessly from breast cancer, a disease that could have been diagnosed easily, early, treated, and cured. And Patty's story is not unique. Many of you have friends like Patty. This is unacceptable. In the memory of Patty and thousands of others, our new administration will expand Medicaid and pay for it sustainably. We will work to ensure that every person has primary care. We will, we will control the cost of health insurance and rein in the cost of prescription drugs. A major part of the health care crisis is the opiate epidemic. History will note that we have abandoned an entire generation of people to, to this preventable disease. The allure of opiates can fill a hole in the human heart caused by loneliness, stress, hopelessness. Even as I speak, there is someone within the sound of my voice about to consume a deadly drug jeopardizing themselves, their friends, their families, their communities. If that person is listening, please know that I and many others are here for you. You are not alone. We will confront this disease together. We will offer a helping hand, not pass judgment. We want you to succeed and to survive. We want to welcome you home again. <clears throat> It is time for action. Narcan, widely available, medication-assisted treatment, recovery coaches, these things will be a reality. And in sad memory of the 418 Maine people who lost their lives to drug overdose in 2017, our administration will create the Director of Opiate Response, a person who will marshal the collective power and resources of this state to stem the tide of this epidemic. Part of that effort will be to fully engage with people in our own communities. Take it outdoors, as one of our favorite retailers puts it. Renewing the healing bond we have with the land and our environment. In addition to protecting the medical health of our people, we will also advance the economic health of our people. To employers, entrepreneurs, and innovators with new ideas for forest products, aquaculture, recreation, renewables, and everything in between, I say you are welcome here. We will offer a world-class workforce. You know, fewer than half of Maine people, Maine adults, now hold a post-secondary credential a college degree or a professional certification, yet two out of three jobs require such credentials. This imbalance is why we have, at the same time, 
employers saying they can't find workers and workers saying they're stuck in dead-end jobs. Education is the key to helping our people achieve their full potential. <laughs> Attracting talented young people to move here and make Maine their home will be a top priority of my administration. And from now on, yes, a sign will greet all those arriving in our state at the Kittery Line and it will say simply, welcome home. They tell me I have to get permission from the turnpike. <laughs> I'll work on it. I will, <laughs> I will work with the new administration, the new legislature, to achieve the best education for our people, from preschool through college and beyond, beginning with full and fair funding for our schools, including our career and technical centers. And we will treat our teachers with the respect and dignity they deserve. There's a few teachers here. Are there any teachers? McCray. There is no higher priority than our children. And with so many people still at Long Creek, with children waiting for critical mental health services, and some even losing their lives to violence in their own homes, it's high time we put children's health and safety first. I'm gonna start with one simple step, calling together the children's cabinet for the first time in years to tackle these issues. Simple. Well, these are some of the challenges we know about, but we must also be prepared for the unexpected. We know that a recession is possible in the next few years. It is. We know that someday robots, drones, driverless cars, broadband, and 3D printing will radically alter the way many people live, learn, and work, and so we need to be ready. Now, I made my own predictions back at the turn of the century, the last century. In the year 1999, I wrote down a journal, of, a list, on a journal, a list of things I thought would stay in the new millennium and things I thought might go away. I predicted, for instance, in, in 50 years, there would no longer be the following things. Cash money, paper bags, spare tires, lint, <laughs> dust, and pantyhose. <laughs> but in 50 years, I said there would likely still be Stephen King bestsellers, <laughs> Baxter State Park, People from Away, and Strom Thurmond. Do they remember him? As you can see, I can't rely on myself too well to predict the future. That's why I'm enlisting help. I'm following the advice of writer Kurt Vonnegut, who said, quote, he said a lot of things, but he also said, quote, every government ought to have a department of the future. And so my administration will create an office of innovation and the future. This office will dive into major policy changes, foster collaboration, and propose concrete workable solutions. Let's look ahead for a change.
Now, here's how I want to govern, <clears throat> because we're all in this together. We all want Maine to have a beautiful environment and happy people and prosperous communities. And although we all agree on a goal, we sometimes differ on how to get there. We are Republicans, Greens, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, and so many more besides. But there's, this is something I know well myself. I mean, every Mills family reunion is like a meeting of the United Nations. <laughs> everyone has an opinion, and everyone wants the microphone. But these differences are what make my family strong. They make every family strong. They make Maine strong. Our, our diversity is a virtue, one that we should harness to advance good public debate and good public policy. We welcome the voices of newcomers also to the public conversation, the young, the immigrants, people of different cultures, people of color, people of different orientations, all are important members of the main family. My town, like many of yours, my town has always had a commons where everybody would graze their sheep and cattle in the old days and sell produce and open a farmer's market now and where we'd all enjoy a concert on a summer evening. Our state needs to find its common ground, expand our horizons, become one Maine again. From the tree streets of Lewiston to the rolling fields of the county, from the bold coast to the height of land, from Cross Rock and Allagash to the Portland's promenades, our people will once again find unity of purpose. We will bring back Maine's tradition of civil discourse expressed by Governor Israel Washburn, a friend of Abraham Lincoln's, in his 1861 inaugural. He said, Waving aside petty schemes and unseemly wrangles, let us rise, if we can, to the height of the great argument which duty and patriotism so eloquently addressed to us. You know, I have fallen in love a few times in my life. There are those in this audience whom I have loved for long and for years, friends and family, and some newly loved but it is the bond we all share for our state, our children longing for security, newcomers seeking to belong, for all those who feel left behind, who long for respect and dignity. One thing we all love is our great state. And when a family, a community, a state believe in each other, help each other, love each other, great things can happen. Maine people have greatness within them. Maine is our home. We are connected by the rivers and the land, the forests and the mountains. We are connected by love. We are strengthened by those connections. We are one Maine, undivided, one family, from Callis to Bethel, from York to Fort Kent. And so we meet this evening, free from care. The heirs of Joseph Addian, Joshua Chamberlain, Flyrod Crosby, and Israel Washburn. And tomorrow, we rise before the dawn like the mist over the Sandy River and seek adventure with hope in our hearts and love in our souls for the brand new day. And to all of you and to all the people of Maine, I say, welcome home. <laughs> welcome home! Governor Janet Trafton Mills, 75th governor of the state of Maine, the first woman to hold that position, concluding her relatively brief remarks here with uh, Megan Maloney, a former Democratic state legislator, now district attorney for Kennebec in Somerset counties, 
also a graduate of Emerge Maine, which recruits and trains women candidates. Megan, we made you sat, sit down to talk to us, <laughs> jumping out of your seats. It's so what exciting. What did you take away from this speech? What an extraordinary speech. You know, she really had all of the elements hitting on every reason that people elected her our governor and even adding her very classic poetry. You know, I, I heard the poetry when she spoke for, uh, on the streets of Lewiston to the hills of Aroostook County, and that's, that's what has made her our governor. All right, Mal, let's start with you. What stuck out to you? She outlined a whole host of problems, and, what, and she said they've got to be addressed. But with every governor... Oh, hold your thought. Let us conclude in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this night in which Janet Mills begins her tenure as our governor. We ask you to watch over her and guide her over the next four years. We also thank you for the many gifts which you have given Governor Mills, especially the gift of her willingness to share her gifts with us the citizens of the great state of Maine. We ask your blessings on her and on the team of administrators she is forming to work with her to face the challenges of our state. Compassionate God, we ask you to shower an openness on all of us as citizens of Maine to do our individual part in cooperating and addressing with the new Mills administration, budgetary, environmental, health, educational, economic, justice, and infrastructure issues. May all of Maine government, executive, legislative, and judicial know their clear roles and cooperate for the common good of all citizens. Our ancestors have known for a long, long time that we are people who can lead, as our motto claims. As the next four years unfold, Almighty God, keep us focused on the big picture, which includes all people, your will, your willingness to help us, and Governor Janet's important role. May all of us be more focused on our supportive role and the greater good than our own personal desires. Loving God, thank you for Governor Mills. Thank you for the good state of Maine. Thank you for self-government. Thank you for this new administration. And thank you for this night. Bless all these realities, and we make this prayer in your name. Amen. That was Father Frank Murray, St. Paul's of the Apostle Bangor. Mal, you were saying laying out a lot of problems, but uh, saying she's going to tackle them head on. Every single governor in their inaugural speeches have laid out the issues facing the state, the problems that is facing the state. Then they face the real hard job of putting together a budget that addresses those problems. And when you list all of the items that Janet Mills has gone through tonight, you begin to realize the daunting task she and her administration is facing to weigh over all those priorities. Which particular program gets the emphasis? Which program doesn't quite get the funding it needs? All right, and Megan, how inspiring to young women, young girls? So inspiring. Janet Mills has been inspiring to me personally, since I was a, in school myself, my parents were both child protective social workers and she was our district attorney. So they actually appeared as witnesses in her court when she was trying the cases. So I've looked up to her my entire life and to see her tonight on this stage is just something I've hoped for for a very long time. So I'm very happy. Well, District Attorney Megan Maloney for Kennebec in Somerset County, thanks for joining us for just a few minutes at the end of the um, speech here. We want to give a special shout out to Herb Adams, legislator, historian who joined us for the bulk of our 
production here tonight. This does conclude tonight's coverage of the inauguration of Governor Janet Mills. You see her leaving the Augusta Civic Center now to great applause. You can watch or listen to this program on demand at mainpublic.org. I'm Jennifer Rooks, along with Maine Public political correspondent Mal Leary. For all of us at Maine Public, good luck, good night, and happy new year.